Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this special time of worship. If you have any questions during the service, please leave a comment on Church Online and I will be right with you. The service will begin shortly, so take a moment to quiet your mind and focus on the story of Jesus.
It is almost impossible for us to imagine ourselves anywhere but right here, right now. Our lives are so riveted to the here and now, it, it's almost impossible to imagine ourselves somewhere else at another time, like 2,000 years ago. Like, rather than being here in the Middle East, another culture where they, where they spoke another language. The birth language of Jesus, Aramaic, familiar to them, but unfamiliar to every one of us. And to be at a place where there would be such, such brutality, such bloody, angry brutality that would take our breath away if we were to witness it firsthand. But uh, we are here and that works against our being there unfortunately, because we must go there to enter into a night like this, night. We have two things working for us in this room. First is the darkness. For all things related to the suffering of Christ, began in darkness. In fact, in the middle of the night, around midnight, in a small garden along the slopes of the Mount of Olives, known as Gethsemane, where he was with his disciples, praying as they slept, and realizing it would be there, he would soon be arrested And the illegal trials would begin, all six of them. And though he would never be proven guilty, he would be declared guilty. And by noon of the next, that very day, he would be suspended from a cross and left there to die. Interestingly, darkness was there as, as well, even though it was midday. For about three hours it hung over that area. It must have been eerie. The darkness, the anguish, the pain, But there he was, hanging between heaven and earth, suspended for hours and dying. It was also silent much of that time. A few words were spoken words of, of forgiveness, remarkably, words of grace. But like here, the silence works for us. It helps us imagine the silence back then. Thankfully, you and I have never witnessed such a scene the worst kind of death ever devised by humanity was his to endure, which he willingly did on our behalf.
And so, to make this time the most meaningful, I urge you to focus your attention on the cross that hangs above and behind me. Ponder that cross. Stare at it. Imagine a body hanging on it. The body of an innocent man paying a price for sins he never committed, but sins that are ours, which he bore on our behalf. And as you ponder and as you stare, ask yourself the question, what wondrous love is this that he would die for me?
One of the scholars under whom I studied at seminary was the Hebrew teacher named Merrill F. Unger. Dr. Unger, now gone from us, has left in his legacy his magnificent 1,400-page Unger's Bible Dictionary, which is packed with information every Bible student or interested student should own and read. Unger covers the crucifixion as well as anyone I've ever read, and he does so in few words, but they are graphic and they're worth hearing. Since we have never witnessed such a brutal death, it seemed appropriate that I read you this description. I quote, Crucifixion was preceded by scourging with long leather thongs to which were sometimes added nails and pieces of bone or metal to heighten the pain. Often the pain was so intense that the victim would die while being scourged even before being nailed to his cross. The criminal carried his own cross beam. The place of execution was outside the city limits. Arriving there, the condemned was stripped of his clothing, which became the property of the execution squad of soldiers. And to that cross, he was nailed with long iron spikes. Having been, pass, pass, having been fastened to the cross, he and the cross were then raised and dropped into a hole. Suddenly, the lower limbs of the victim were generally three or four feet from earth. If the nailing was the more painful mode in the first instance, hanging suspended was even more so in the end. The victim was left to hang there and die of sheer exhaustion since he needed to raise himself up and down, up and down repeatedly in order to breathe. Instances are on record of persons surviving for nine days suspended on a cross before dying. In most cases, the body was allowed to rot on the cross by the action of the sun and the wind and rain, or simply to be devoured by birds or beasts. The body eventually wore out from the pain and the unnatural suspension until the victim died hanging there. Close quote. The brutality of it all staggers the mind of anyone with even a hint of compassion. What everyone saw as Jesus of Nazareth hung there in agony was dreadful. What they heard, however, was remarkable. Words of forgiveness followed by it is finished. Transliterated in the gospel account as tetelestai. That same Greek word tetelestai has been found written on papyri, used as receipts on taxes. It's actually a financial term meaning paid in full. The price for our redemption from sin was paid in full when he died in our place on that cross. The victory had been won. John the Apostle writes that in that moment Jesus leaned his head back 
and gave up his spirit. One insightful New Testament writer observes that John used a word for leaned back, which is often used for settling back upon a pillow before sleeping. His work was completed. His mission given by the Father was accomplished. To tell us, Ty. It is fitting that we pause and let the wonder of it all invade our senses as we worship by asking, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? And then let us worship the Lamb of God, who was slain, having taken away the sins of the world.
Return with me to an intimate scene that occurred even before Christ was arrested. The twelve had gathered with their master for the Passover meal together. It would be their last meal with him, though they did not know that when they arrived. The disciples had prepared this meal throughout their lives. They watched their mothers and fathers do so when they were little boys growing up in Jewish homes. So it was all familiar to them. There was a lamb, a lamb without blemish, roasted over an open fire on a spit made of pomegranate wood. The entire lamb must be roasted. Then there was bread, not like our loaves of bread, soft and tasty. This bread was unleavened bread, bread made without yeast. It was flat, brittle, almost a tasteless pastry. There were herbs, bitter herbs, to remind them of the bitterness of slavery their forefathers endured while slaves in Egypt for 400 and more years. There was a paste called Karosheth with the consistency of our dip. It reminded them of the clay from which the bricks had been made in Egypt and there was a chalice containing wine which was sipped on four stages during the meal. All of this again was familiar to these men. What wasn't familiar was how it ended. Jesus closed his eyes and offered up a prayer, tight-lipped, surprised, and frowning. The twelve bowed in prayer with him. Later, Jesus gently said, now eat this bread. It represents my body, which is given for you. When you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. As the flat pastry was passed among them, each man snapped off a piece and let it melt in his mouth. They wondered then what all this meant. Jesus then reached over and picked up the chalice containing wine. He handed it to the one reclining next to him as he said, now, now drink this. Think of it as my blood poured out for many. I'll not eat or drink this meal with you again till we do so in the kingdom of my father. A chill must have rushed down their spines when they heard those words. That was their first direct hint that this was their last meal with the master. Following their eating the bread and drinking from the cup together, the presence of darkness must have seemed thick among them as Satan entered into Judas. From that moment on, he became Lucifer's pawn. Jesus looked at him directly and said, what you have to do, do it quickly. The deceiver stood instantly and left the upper room. John tells us 
when he walked out, it was night. No night was ever darker, no room ever more suspenseful. By nine o'clock the following morning, their master, beaten and bruised body, would be hanging from a cross at Golgotha. What a moment. They stared in disbelief and they wondered what comes next. They were soon to find out. Jesus. 
we come now to the most meaningful part of our time together. Down through the centuries, churches and chapels and temples and tabernacles, there have been believers who have met together following the instruction of the Apostle Paul who wrote, I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread and having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. You will be served the bread. Hold it in your hands. Retain it until we've all been served. I will lead us as we take it together. After the bread, he took the cup in the same manner and told him this cup represents my blood. Drink from it. And as often as you do, drink it in remembrance of me. For as, you all, as often as you eat the bread and drink from the cup, you keep on declaring the Lord's death until he returns. It may be that you have gathered with us this evening not knowing Christ. You may have come as a friend of someone who loves this church. You may have come altogether on your own, perhaps out of curiosity. You may have wondered what a Friday night, good Friday service includes. Now you know, but it's incomplete for you. Or without Christ as your savior, you, you witness it all from a distance. However, it need not remain so. This is a perfect occasion for you to trust in the one who died and paid for your sins in full. And then you are free to eat the bread and drink from the cup. But if you choose not to do so, please let the elements pass. For this is for believers only. We eat the bread together as I will lead you, and then we will drink from the cup again as I lead you. May we bow for prayer. What a meaningful time this is, our Father. And as we participate in this sacred moment, we feel ourselves linked to those from the past who have observed the table of the Lord together down through the centuries. Thank you for our Savior's body given for us, beaten and bruised, that we might be delivered from sin. Thank you for his blood poured out on our behalf, washing away our sins. We remember his body and his blood and we do so with great thanksgiving. Be pleased in our time together as we sit quietly in this dark, silent room, lost in our thoughts, focusing on the cross where the price was paid. In the Savior's name, we pray. Amen.
With deep gratitude, we take this bread and eat it in remembrance of our Savior's body given for us.
It is with gratitude for our Savior's blood that we drink this in remembrance of him.
Thank you again for joining us this evening. As you reflect on what you heard tonight, we pray that the Lord would guide you into a deeper relationship with Him. We hope you'll join us again this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and all that it means for those who believe in Him. Have a blessed weekend.